So welcome to Citizen Science Reflections and Perspectives brought to you by the South Australian chapter of the Australian Citizen Science Association. And we are celebrating national, International Citizen Science Month this month. So I'm Sylvia, um, you all know me, but for others out there that might be watching this, I'm the current chair of the South Australian chapter of the Australian Citizen Science Association. So I'd just like to start by acknowledging the Australian Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people of this nation, and we pay our respects to their ancestors and elders past and present, and recognise their unique cultural and spiritual relationships to the land, waters and seas, and their rich contribution to science and society. So just a little bit of housekeeping. I'm sure you all know the, the Zoom and Teams etiquette to keep your microphones off while the speakers are presenting. Uh, you can leave your videos on or off while they're presenting, it's up to you. We'll have a little bit of question time. So you lovely audience members, I hope you got your questions and <laughs> question hats on for us, um, or we can ask questions of each other as well. Um, so you can turn your microphones and your videos back on for question time. Uh, you can put your hand up using the hand icon um, or you can put a question in the chat if you like. And we have Katie, Irvine and Bella as well in the background who will be helping. And if you forget to mute yourself and we can eat, hear you eating your dinner, or we'll, we'll mute you um, <laughs> while the speakers are, are speaking. Uh, we will have some extra time at the end. The speakers will have around 12 minutes with some, about three minutes for questions. Uh, but if there's any, any more or any further discussion, we can have that at the end with everybody as well. And... Yes, if you're not comfortable with being part of the recording, let us know and we'll try and zip you out somehow when we share the recording, which will go on AXA's YouTube channel. Um, last thing is the toilets and the fire exits are behind you. I assume. <laughs> <laughs> uh, now, just a quick introduction. I just want to say that in South Australia, this seems to be a really exciting time for citizen science. We've had some quite a few projects bubbling along for quite a while now, but with two rounds of Australian citizen, the Australian government citizen science grants and quite a few South Australian projects being awarded funding, it's been fantastic. And it's three years now since that last round came out. And uh, tonight we'll be hearing from three of the groups that have been running those projects to as the funding is coming to an end you know how what have they learnt, where to now those kind of things and we also have the exciting two million dollars citizen science fund from the state government uh, administered through the department of environment and water which has delivered some small grants last year and an imminent announcement apparently for the large grant grants, which will be very exciting. They've also been supporting the South Australian Citizen Science Awards for the last couple of years as well, and seem to be interested in continuing to do that, which is fantastic. Another exciting development has been the Oliphant Science Awards with the Science Teachers Association here in the state, uh, developing a Citizen Science Award for schools, which was very popular last year, and hopefully will continue to connect schools with Citizen Science as well. We have so many projects here, um, and they're all making a wonderful difference for our world and making our society a better place. And we have such a wonderful supportive network in South Australia and nationally, and I'm sure it's only gonna go onwards and upwards from here. So that's it from me. I'm gonna firstly hand over to Erin to talk about insect investigators, and then we'll be followed by Kirsten talking about passport to recovery. And lastly, Mike Thompson and myself talking about 1 million turtles. So, over to you, Erin. All right, is that, can you see and hear me all right, Sylvia? Yes. Thank you. Awesome. All right. Well, I'm talking on behalf of the Insect Investigators team, um, and our aims for our project are about documenting Australia's insect biodiversity, so trying to use these uh, passive sampling traps called malaise traps, which catch mostly flying insects. We then do a bunch of DNA barcoding, which is sequencing a small portion of the genome of these different insects, which tells us a little bit about species diversity. And then also trying to do a bit of taxonomy. So actually trying to document uh, different species, not only using their DNA, but trying to get some names on some of 
the estimated 150,000 undescribed insect species in Australia. We also have participant aims, which are mostly around education and awareness uh, of entomology and biodiversity, uh, but also about taxonomy. So my dream is that every primary school child knows what a taxonomist does, as well as they know what a paleontologist does. Um, so these are sort of the background aims behind the project, what we're trying to do. Um, Sylvia asked us to talk about what the grant allowed us to do. So I thought I would compare what we could do with a very small amount of money when we first started the project versus what we did with the large um, Australian government citizen science grant. So I trialled the project with an AXA seed grant in 2019. It was $1,000. And what that allowed me to do was to work with four different schools in South Australia or in regional areas, so Cow on the Air Peninsula, Wakery and Ramco in the Riverland and Macclesfield in the Adelaide Hills. Uh, and with these four schools, I managed to travel out there. We set up traps that the schools then monitored for kind of varying amounts of time. Um, and we looked at just one group of wasps that I was working on for my postdoc. So I'm a parasitoid wasp taxonomist by trade. Um, and I work on this little subfamily called Microgastrinae. They're parasitoids of caterpillars. Uh, and each of the schools collected some samples uh, over several different weeks. I hunted through the insects they caught and just picked out this one group of wasps that I had funding to work on. Um, and each of them found a new species. So we worked with the schools and the schools each gave them a new name. And then these were published in a scientific paper um, as formally described new species. So with $1,000 and an already funded postdoc, um, we could look at four wasps um, with four schools. With $480,000, um, so with a very large amount of money, we managed to work with 50 regional schools across three states. So the insect investigators national, well, not quite national, three-state project, um, even though we covered quite a lot of the geography of Australia, um, started, we were funded in the mid-2021 round, so the second half of 2021 was planning, and then these are the schools that collected samples in 2022. So with each of these 50 schools, we sent out a package, and that package each had a malaise trap in it, um, malaise traps are not cheap, they cost about $450, so that was a reasonable chunk of budget. Um, we sent out insect collecting materials so the schools could uh, do some interacting with some live insects whilst they had the trap running, do their own, own sampling, put pictures on INAT at the same time that they were running the trap. Um, all the postage materials for them to get the samples back to us uh, and a few different yeah, resources that they could keep. In two of our states, in Western Australia and Queensland, our team ran uh, in-person workshops with most of the schools in their state at the start of the project. In South Australia, because incursions were still closed for COVID at the time, um, we ran online workshops at the start of the project, but the schools had access to a really nice professionally done video um, to show them how to set the trap up. So all the schools around Australia put the trap up at the same time. They ran it for four weeks um, and sent the samples into us at the university. So uh, 200 parcels arrived on my desk over the course of about six weeks. Um, and those samples we hunted through and we tried to pick out about 300 specimens um, from each school, which we then sent to our partners at the Centre of Biodiversity Genomics in Canada. They did the sequencing of those 14,000 insect specimens and then sent all those specimens back to us here in Australia um, so that we could pick out the um, particular insects that we had taxonomists interested in. So taxonomists, um, as this audience would know, are very, very specific. They might work on one family of flies or uh, one group of arachnids and so we sent them the data and the images and they said hey this is the group I work on and um, these are the ones I'd be interested in seeing so we then picked through all of the specimens that had been returned to us from Canada packaged them up and sent them off to those experts and they gave us some um, um, updated identifications but some of them also were, said hey we've got a species that we are happy to work with schools um, to actually put a name on and my computer's just frozen. Oh. 
Sorry, Sylvia. So we had about, about six or seven taxonomists who got back to us quite quickly with things they could describe, um, but several more who are still looking through the data. So hopefully we might still be able to keep going with some new species. Are you able to see that slide again? Awesome. Um, so here's just a couple examples of some that actually got named during the project timeline. So this is Califora Kaisai, which was named by Kangaroo Island Community Education students, so you named it after the school, um, in collaboration with Nick Johnson, pictured there, who's a fly taxonomist. Um, and then we've got two bee flies uh, named in collaboration with Chris Lambkin, a fly taxonomist in Queensland, um, South Newman, named after the school, and then Sinclair, which the students actually voted to name it after their science teacher, which I thought was really, really lovely. So just a couple of examples of some of the actual taxonomy that happened during the project. But for a lot of the schools, we were able to just give them results based on the DNA data. So through the project, we had nearly five and a half thousand different species that were collected and sequenced. We were able to get nearly 500 of those to a species level identification, but most of course don't because we don't have the reference databases here in Australia for our named insect species, and most of them are not named yet. Um, we created about a 4% increase in the number of public DNA barcodes of Australian insects, but quite a large percentage increase in the number of barcodes where the specimen actually is back here in Australia and really easily accessible to researchers. So that's something I'm super proud of, and I think we made a really massive impact with that grant. It allowed us to do a huge amount of sequencing over a huge geographical area in Australia and work with a huge number of students and teachers. Uh, so we were asked to talk about what worked well. Um, probably the most surprising thing or the thing that I was most excited about and maintained excitement about is that teachers were actually keen to be involved. I was always scared we would send out this expression of interest form uh, about being part of this project and that no one would want to do it um, because teachers are so busy. Insects can be a hard sell. Um, you know, they're not cute and fluffy. Uh, and I wasn't sure if teachers felt like they would have the capacity to set up this trap and run it for four weeks. But we had over 200 expression of interest for our 50 spots that we had budget for. So I think that shows that there's real, um, like a real hunger from teachers for projects like this, where they're being involved in real research. Um, nearly all our schools were super successful. So we got, I think, 198 of the 200 bottles back from schools. So nearly all the schools ran all four weeks and all of those bottles just about came back to us to sort through. And they all caught way more insects than I thought they would to the point where we were a little bit overwhelmed with the number of specimens that we needed to sort through. But that was awesome, like that we can ask schools to put a trap up in their schoolyard and get this incredible diversity. And um, so that was really great. We had an amazing team. So I think that's such a big part of whether projects succeed or not is who you actually have involved. And we had a really, really large team that I'll go, I've got listed at the end and you'll just see the number of different people working on this project. But one of the really nice things was that we actually had people based in each of the three states we were working in, which meant that when there were border lockdowns, we could still have people visiting schools. Um, it also meant that the people in those states had a much, I guess, better finger on the pulse of the citizen science environment, the education environment, the kind of schools, all that sort of thing in their local area, or at least on a state level, um, which I think helped with those relationships with schools a lot more um, than if all those schools were just hearing from someone at one institution. Um, we found the DNA barcoding approach was really, really great, meant we could get some fast results back to schools. Um, we almost got everything done in time that we were trying to um, and we got some species named by people who weren't just me, so that was great. Um, so yeah, some of these kind of quite um, ambitious outcomes we actually managed to get done um, and we got really, really lovely feedback from teachers. So some really nice comments and um, most teachers were really, really keen to be involved in future citizen science projects. But we did learn hard lessons. Um, a school year is really, really short in terms of doing science. 
And when you're working with schools, you really need to try and work within the school year because teachers move on, especially in regional areas. Um, kids, you know, year to year, they change, they're in different classes, they're studying different things. So it works different for teachers to link stuff to curriculum. When you're working across states, school holidays don't match up, which is really frustrating when you're trying to think about end of term deadlines. Um, teachers are incredible, but so busy and it is hard to maintain um, really strong engagement over the year if you're not putting heaps of effort and time into it. Um, and that meant we did lose contact with a few of our teachers by the end of the project. We're not sure that all of the students got the results passed on to them. Um, I think most of them did, but that's something we can't really guarantee when we're sort of relying on the teachers to pass it on. Um, and we did lose some of the touch with some of the schools during the taxonomy part uh, in that there were some schools where we started running a taxonomy workshop and then it just it became really, really difficult to get that finalised. Um, I would say always have good systems for collecting even really simple data. So all we really needed from teachers was the dates that they were changing the trap bottles and the GPS of the trap. We tried to get a bit more data about things like habitat and which way the trap was pointing and um, weather and stuff like that. And we brought in the system probably a bit late in the process, um, which meant that we really struggled to get really consistent data from everyone. We need it. We really should have had it set up at the start and it should have been part of that really initial thing that we asked the citizen scientists to do when they started collecting, not partway through collecting. Um, so yeah, get the data right from the start. Um, we had a bit of a mix up with some GPSs um, and uh, I now have 4,000 specimens that need relabeling. So get your data right from the start. Um, and the other thing I really learned, which I thought I already knew, was that doing evaluation is really hard. Um, and I wish I'd had a bigger budget for it and um, had put, I really needed a staff member budgeted for who just was in charge of evaluation um, and ethics applications. If you're working with schools, you need eight months to get those through. So take that into consideration. Sorry, I'm already running slightly over time, but my next few things will be quick. Um, so museum staff being involved was one of the partnerships, which is incredible because it meant our specimens um, were collected in a way that meant they could be accessioned and go straight into the museums and be used by researchers into the future. So having an idea of what, if you've got people collecting specimens, what's going to happen to those at the end and having those people involved from the design stage, I think is really critical. Oh no. And I think my next slide is about the partnership we had, particularly with the South Australian Museum. And I wanted to mention that just because the partnership between the uni and the museum in this project, I think was incredibly beneficial for both institutions and allowed us to do some really amazing things in terms of having both scientific, but also education staff, Leanne and that involved, but then all the functionality of working within a university and how easy it was to um, quickly hire casual staff, have access to big lab spaces, and this is a partnership that's really in jeopardy in the moment if you're aware of the South Australian Museum landscape. So I just mentioned that that was critical for this project and maybe a partnership that won't be possible again in the future, which is a bit sad. Um, our awesome school teams partnerships, like I mentioned before, having someone in each state running those school liaison and workshops were amazing. Working with the Centre of Barcoding, Centre of Biodiversity Genomics in Canada was incredible. Their team is amazing. Um, and there were some partnerships where it worked really well in some states. So in South Australia, working with Kate Dilger, who's incredible with the Science Teacher Associations and with Eleanor as part of Land Care SA, worked really well. Um, but connections in other states with those networks definitely dropped off after the start of the project. So that was a partnership management issue that, yeah, was my fold and we kind of just couldn't maintain communication. So not all partnerships that you start with will necessarily follow you through to the end of the project. Um, this is our incredible team. You can see the amazing people and institutions who are part of it. Um, in terms of papers, we've got a couple of cool little papers out. Um, one of the little taxonomy papers, a new fly that um, is the first record for Australia that the students in Queensland published some pictures of in the paper. 
um, you can see we're trying to make sure we acknowledge our teachers by name and then our students by class in all the papers. Uh, we've got some more taxonomy papers in press uh, and hopefully a big overview paper coming this year. Keeps slipping down the priority list, but um, this year it's going to happen. Where to next? We've had some failed grant applications to get some continued funding. Um, so I'm trying to hold a stakeholder workshop this year, bring together our old partners, new partners, potential funding, work out what the priorities would be if we were to kind of launch this into a national program with some bigger infrastructure. You know, how do we do that? Where do we get the funding and what would people want it to look like? Thank you to our schools. They're awesome. And I will stop talking now. Thanks for dealing with my uh, tech issues. <laughs> You, you managed it very well. Thank you, Erin. <laughs> <laughs> very insightful, yes. <laughs> um, does anyone have a couple of questions? Question or two for Erin? Alison. Um, yes, I mean, I, I know the project. Um, and it's great that you wrote some, uh, got some papers published, but did you find ways um, to communicate sort of beyond the schools that you were working with? Was there much interest from like, you know, local papers and that sort of thing? Yeah, the, the new species stories are really easy mm -hmm. to sell to the media and the local papers and um, radio stations loved them. The bigger picture, like, you know, we've found 300 different species of insect at this school, but I can't tell you exactly what they are because we don't have names for most insects. That story is, was much harder to share. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, still working out the best ways of doing that. Yeah. Oh, it's, it's cool to hear that there, there was some, you know, um, interest because, like you say, bugs are hard sometimes. Yeah, because yeah, they're not cute. Yeah. Well, <laughs> but I think getting... people, they're not cute. Yeah. 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 When you get to name something, that's when it's much easier, I guess, to share the story and we sort of use that as the jumping platform into other things. Nice. Oh, great. Uh, I can't hear you, Sylvia. Yeah. Um, you mentioned, you can hear me? Yeah. yeah. You mentioned that um, the evaluations are hard and if you had more or you wish you'd had more dollars to do the evaluations, what would you have done with those more dollars? Uh, you know, what I would have um, hired someone to who. So oh. I would have hired a social scientist to do it and to manage all the putting in of ethics applications and um, just like that. Yeah, it took up so much mm. time, um, and yeah. I, I wish I had known better the kinds of questions we would have want to ask. Because by the time we got the approval, the questions I'd put approval in for weren't the questions I wanted to ask anymore. But it was too late. Yes, okay. Any others? I've just got one, Erin. Um, in terms of the taxonomic process and describing more species, I guess this could go forever. Is it still continuing and how is that sort of being yeah, managed? Yeah, it is. I, um, I heard from one of our WASP taxonomists, Juanita Anik in Canberra just last week that she thinks she's found a new genus at the South Australian School. Um, so that's really exciting. So, yeah, I think it'll just keep slowly trickling in and it'll just be about trying to reconnect with the school, see if there's still a teacher and some kids there who want to be involved in that. Yes. All right. I think we might move on to Kirsten, if that's all right. Thank you very much. Um, thanks, Sylvia. Um, Erin, that's amazing. <laughs> well, well done. Really fabulous work that you've done. Um, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, right, so my name's Kirsten Ross and I'm stepping in um, because Karen uh, was uh, not available. Uh, she is sort of the oversight, um, person having oversight of this project. But it's interesting, Erin, that you mentioned the idea of a social scientist because we were lucky in that uh, Gareth Butler, who's um, in this project, um, is a social scientist. So he has an understanding of that qualitative research. So that was one of the things um uh, that's been really helpful both in determining how we evaluate it in the beginning but then also how we do some evaluation at the end. Um, yeah, and then uh, the other folk on there that I should acknowledge, Cassie, um, uh, Ryan and Julian as well. So essentially it is five, uh, seven citizen science projects 
uh, within Kangaroo Island. Um, and there's a single onboarding app and a passport that goes with it for 10 of the projects. And then there's two other partner projects, uh, Noburn and CoSnap, um, that require separate onboarding that have been actually developed by other people that we've now sort of um, implemented as part of our citizen science project. Um, it's lovely that there's ended up being 12 because you can see that aesthetically 12 looks really good. Um, uh, they all sit nicely together in a rectangle. Um, that wasn't necessarily deliberate, but that's worked out very well well and essentially um, there was a combination of reasons for doing this project so partly we were interested we were certainly interested in gathering heaps of um, data using the citizen science approach but we also were really concerned about um, the bushfires that were ha that had happened um, in Kangaroo Island and what that might do for um, the economy um, and I, I was already working um, on the island doing the phytophthora stuff that got picked up in this project and so there was real concern about the fact that the economy was very reliant on tourism and it wasn't entirely clear whether that would recover. Um, it has recovered. Um, I'm, I don't think we can claim <laughs> complete responsibility for that um, but there has been you know a significant um, recovery and that's that's really excellent to see um, so like I said there's 12 projects and the and um, the first year year one projects were some of which we sort of had partly already on the go so um, the dirty boots project which was mine was looking at phytophthora uh, plant pathogen um, and we were interested in knowing whether or not um, uh, pedestrian tourists um, were picking up the 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 um, the water mold and then moving it to other places or whether it was like large uh, soil movement. So there's one activity that students do where they, not students, sorry, I've been teaching too much today, uh, that the citizen scientists do where they take a sample from their boots after they've been for a walk. Um, there's the Smart Nest um, project, which is essentially looking at native bees um, and using some um, fancy technology to monitor the entry and exit of native bees into these Smart Nests. Um, there's Reef Rewind, which is a restoration reef that we're currently in the process of building. And I'll get to that when we start to talk about some of the things that um, were a little bit more difficult. And then Koala Compass, which was monitoring the return of koalas to bushfire affected areas. So a lot of the koalas had moved to um, areas that they hadn't previously been in. And so they, that was already partly a project that was partly underway as well. Uh, in the second year, uh, we implemented another four projects, and these were all pretty much brand new projects that were developed with citizen science in mind. Um, Debris de Detective, which is looking at microplastic sampling. So um, citizen scientists take samples of the sand and they send it through to us and we can analyze it for microplastics. Um, sea Lion Stakeout, which is assessing ecotourism impact on the seals and the behavior of the, um, sorry, on the sea lions at Seal Bay. Um, road to recovery, which is using roadkill as an indicator of wildlife recovery. So um, it doesn't. It seems a little bit um, back to front, but essentially, they're seeing the the, the killed um, animals on the road can tell you where on where they've um, ended up. And then lovebirds, which is using some nice um, uh, technology using facial symmetry in Cape Barren geese to monitor their movements across the island. And then the third year projects are. Two that, um, like I said, have um, are already in existence elsewhere in Australia that we've now um, established on Kangaroo Island. So Noburn, um, which is a, pro a project that's based on um, artificial intelligence prediction of where bushfires are likely to occur based on things like um, amount of um, vegetation and drying vegetation and so on. Um, and CoSnap, which is one, uh, where there's a, um, a, a, ca a camera cradle that you can put your phone in and take photographs which allows monitoring of the changes um, in the environment over a long period of time and those two have been incorporated into um, uh, Passport to Recovery and then My Island Footprint which is something that we've partly developed um, we've utilised existing um, uh, footprint um, uh, assessment technology and, and altered that to allow the citizen scientists to m measure their carbon footprint while they're on holidays. And then finally, one that's in the process of um, just being established, which is looking at um, uh, orb weaver spiders. And I won't talk too much about that because I don't know what I'm talking about with that one. Um, so here's some data that show uh, some of our preliminary results for, um, and in the top left-hand corner are the map of the phytophthora. 
Now, that's really interesting because we are also getting the citizen scientists to monitor the, um, the, the grass tree dieback, which is a really good indicator of um, initial infection with uh, Phytophthora. And we're seeing infection, but we're not seeing transfer associated with boots. Now, that could just be, mean that our um, measuring approach is not sensitive enough, but it also could be a really good sign in that we're actually seeing um, th th that the um, small amount of soil that... Um, of topsoil uh, that uh, tourists walk around might not be the thing that's responsible for the trans uh, transmission of the of the phytophthora. So really lovely piece of data, um, heap of data that could just not be generated without all the input of all those citizen scientists. So yeah, really lovely for us and my PhD student who's working on that because yeah, like I say, if he had to go and do that sampling, uh, there's no way that he could get anywhere near this kind this level of results. Um, and then the koala project on the bottom left hand corner. Um, and uh, the, the roadkill project. Um, and you can see um, the roadkill project has a huge amount of data. There's a couple of people who've become super interested in that who are locals, uh, and they're, every time they see roadkill, they'll stop and, and uh, work out what it is and upload those data. So essentially that's come from just a few people who are really interested in that. Um, so that's an overview of the project. Um, here are the industry and local partners, and we've got a whole heap of partners. A bit, uh, our most influential partnership, I suppose, is probably C-Link because they've provided access um, to students and, and staff to go backwards and forwards between Kangaroo Island and the mainland. But they've also been running the video that we made. So it means that when people are sitting on the, uh, on the ferry, they can be watching the video that tells them about um, Passport to Recovery and then they pick up the passport uh, when they get off the ferry on Kangaroo Island. So that's been really excellent. And then a whole bunch of other um, industry and local partners. And then we also have a rewards program where if people do a certain number of activities, they can redeem their rewards um, for, you know, a bit of a, a lower price coffee or, you know, tasting honey. Or, so different activities that are, and we're calling them our rewards partners. And they have, that's been brilliant relationships that have been um, really excellent to establish. So we were asked to talk about some of the challenges um, the, and, and the successes. To be honest, the biggest challenge has just been not really realising how long it takes to get permits and so on to do things. So, um, you know, for example, putting up a sign about uh, the microplastic collection and so on, um, that had to go through a whole heap of different permits, which totally makes sense, but you just don't imagine how long that's actually going to take to get those approvals in place. Um, the other one that was really difficult to get approval was for was the, um, the reef restoration. And um, having said that, that's going in one of the reasons that no one else can talk tonight is because they're all preparing to go over to Kangaroo Island to put the reef in place. So that's super exciting. Uh, on a more positive note, the successes. So partnering um, with a local Kangaroo Island group for each of the 12 projects. So um, uh, each, each project had a specific group that they were um, partnering with and they are really terrific partnerships. Um, like I said, the C-Link partnership to recruit the citizen scientists was has been really, really excellent. Um, the other thing that's been really terrific from a lecturer's point of view is that we've had a load of um, undergraduate students um, involved in a whole heap of things, not just the science side. So we had the marketing students making, um, uh, doing a marketing uh, campaign and branding. We had um, tourist students um, coming over and helping us um, actually work out how to promote stuff to students. We had... Um, um, our screen and television students developing uh, videos and so on. So it's engaged a whole heap of um, uh, university students in a whole heap of activities um, that's been fantastic. Uh, we've had one publication. We've got a few more in preparation. Um, so um, we did a literature review really to inform how we were going to monitor um, the success of our or, or otherwise of our citizen science project. So we looked at how other people were doing it so that we could work out how we could best do it. Um, we've also uh, half written a model paper um, on the passport to recovery um, one about using tourists as citizen scientists um, and how that changes their perspective of the environment. Um, and then also uh, navigating the planning per permit getting and installation of reefs for ref restoration because that was, like I said, the most challenging one of all. And
And I think, oh uh, yeah. So and in the future, um, we are partnering with the tour with tour operators on Kangaroo Island to take their guests to participate. Um, and we're hoping that this might provide a source of ongoing funding. Um, we're also partnering with the Australian uh, Children's University Australia, which is a um, which essentially gives um, activities for students um, dis from disadvantaged areas um, to to do. So this kind of fits really nicely with those activities. Um, but yeah, of course, just like Erin said, we're now seeking sponsorship for the passport printing because that's one of our major costs um, to make sure that we can continue to use that um, uh, that that handheld passport. Because even though we've got the app, there's something about the physicality associated with the passport um, that people really like. So thank you very much. Thank you, Kirsten. Uh, oh, Alice has got a hand up pretty quick. <laughs> quick, if if there's time for a question. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. So how? So I just was wondering how the data is displayed back to the citizen scientists. Like, is it like those maps that you were showing, or is there a different? Yeah. So it really depends. Let me just go back to this one slide here. It really depends on how um, on on the different projects. So there's the there's there's mapping. Um, there's also uh, you can. Um, there's a series of photographs that are available for the monitoring the environment over time and so on. So the website. Um, uh, the website's really good. You can go in and you can see what um, what's come before, and then um, how to do it, how to do it yourself. So yeah, there's different ways that it's presented in different things. The reef one is going to be um, an interesting one because we're also monitoring the changes in time of um, um, of particular organisms that go and live there. So that's going not going to that's not going to lend itself so well to the mapping stuff. The mapping stuff is the are those four projects that I showed you. So um, yeah, the idea is that it's it's constantly evolving so as soon as um, data are available we we um, upload it um, and we do that about every three or four weeks um, but yeah uh, I'm not entirely sure how we're going to display the footprint data that'll be an interesting one to do but that's one that's just sort of coming on board now do you have a question had your hand up no, 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 no. <laughs> Anyone else got a question? I've got a couple. Um, in terms of the social evaluation, did people fill in an evaluation survey at the end and how did you try and get them to do that? If yeah, <laughs> yeah. So um, we got them to do a survey beforehand and then we gave them a code that was a uh, last two letters of the first yeah anyway code so that we could then identify them later yes you're exact, actually you're absolutely right it's really hard to get them to do the second one they're all enthusiastic for the first one um, we've made it as simple as possible so it's on an app um, and it asks questions um, some questions that we've based on other people's research so we can do some comparative stuff and then also a couple more um, for us to explore about the specifics around ours. It's really hard. Um, ultimately, the best approach has been to pay students to go on board the ferry so that if people are not feeling too ill, they'll be willing to answer questions and we can capture those data both as they before they embark on it and then also as they've completed it. But it is one of those challenges. But I think the fact that we do have people captive on a ferry um, captive is, yeah, <laughs> is very helpful, yeah. <laughs> Um, and in terms of the number of participants, did you feel that went well or not? didn't quite land where you wanted or um, what are you thinking in the future? Okay, so the... Um the number of so the number of people who download the app is much higher than the number of people who uh, go through with it, and I think you possibly might have found similar sorts of things with other citizen science projects. Yeah. One of the difficulties we're finding on Kangaroo Island, and this probably will be addressed in the future, is that there's quite a few areas where um, reception's not good enough, and that's another reason really to keep with the um, the, the 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 physical passport um, and and the reward systems where you actually get a physical stamp. Um, yeah, I, to be honest, I think um, the numbers are, we're pretty happy with the numbers, um, but it's also not not necessarily clear. Like I said, we were getting so much data for the um, uh, the roadkill project, um, and then it actually turned out that there was just it was just a few people. So we probably need better mechanisms to actually evaluate that side of it as well. 
It's there all is a no learning just love process. Roadkill. Yeah. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Um, that's a, it was such an ambitious project, like pre- delivering so many different citizen science projects was ju- it's just incredible. So well done. And I, I guess you. you're hoping that these will continue. Like there's enough support within Flinders to keep this going. Yeah, certainly a lot of them uh, are based around research projects, and I'm frightened that once those PhD students, so that that sort of gives us that extra few years um, of cheapish labour. Um, I'm frightened that um, yeah, there there'll be less interest um, for the research side, or no, not interest, but less um, maintaining um, of the projects. Certainly, there's still strong interest from the um, industry um, that we're engaged with and also the tourists themselves. It's it's just that it's, you know, uh, it's, it is costly, um, uh, particularly things like that physical passport printing. So, yeah, we've got our fingers tightly crossed that we'll be able to uh, maintain the research um, through researchers rather than having to continually acquire grants. I think I've just monopolised the time. Did Did anyone else? have a question before we move on. Oh, excellent. Thank you, Kirsten. All right, lucky last, we've got Mike Thompson and his sidekick. <laughs> okay. Right. One million turn. Oh, sorry, I have to move you, Sylvia, on my screen. <laughs> oh. Oh. There we go. Uh, so one million turtles. Uh, thank you, Sylvia. So this is a joint presentation by Sylvia and me. What I'm going to do um, initially is just tell you about one million turtles, what it is, uh, and then really try to address the questions that the previous two um, um, uh, projects have al- already discussed. And of course, I think we're going to find quite a lot of commonalities. Um, so um, the million turtles program uh, really started uh, some time before the citizen science grant, although the citizen science grant from three years ago uh, was where the name One Million, well, it's called the One Million Turtles Community Conservation Program, although uh, we've been working on these turtles for a while. Um, and one of the, the things that's already come up is the importance of the team. And we've got a fantastic team um, consisting of four academics from three universities in, uh, sorry, four academics from four universities in three states, um, and Sylvia at the Landscape Board, uh, and we've hired um, Gita as well, who has um, uh, all sorts of skills that the rest of us don't have. So what I think is that the uh, whole project is much more than the sum of those parts. None of us could have achieved what we've been achieving uh, alone or maybe in partnership with one or two others um, it's the um, it's the combination of the team that's really important. Um, and we've got many, many partners in, involved in this, and there's the logos of some of those partners on the screen there. Uh, and I'm not going to go into all of those. So what are the aims of the One Million Turtles program? Um, first of all, it's called One Million Turtles because the objective is to allow a million baby turtles to hatch from eggs. So in other words, the eggs are... are, are um, laid naturally in nature um, and uh, the babies are well the eggs aren't eaten by predators basically and the babies can return to nature um, in my back of the envelope calculation we need much more than a million but we're going to start with a million <laughs> um, second there uh, secondly we wanted to empower citizen scientists um, we wanted to um, and we've, we've had this theme as well um, uh, give them an opportunity to upskill um, as scientists in a way that then enables them to continue um, with active conservation of turtles in their areas into the future. Um, we also um, have the Turtle Sat app um, and um, a computer-based platform as well um, to map turtle populations and in particular their nesting areas. Um, I'll say a little bit more about that later. Um, and the TurtleSat app, which is Australia-wide and is free and it's available to a- anybody, um, is also um, helping us to identify causes of mortality of turtles. So they're sort of the core objectives, um, and then a lot of other things have come from it as well. So why did we start this program? Well, it's because we're, many of us were working on the Murray, 
Um, and what we found was that there's been a massive decline in populations of turtles. These are very long-lived animals. They probably live for 100 years or even maybe more. Um, and uh, the two commonest species have declined by 70 to 90%, depending on the species, in the Murray since 1980. And in fact, the situation in South Australia is even worse than that. And what's more, there are very few juveniles coming through the population to replace the uh, the old ones when they do die um, due to predation, particularly by European foxes. So how did we go about um, running the uh, the grant? Um, we we used every tool that we possibly could, I think, um, uh, and there's uh, a, a tool to um, increase the knowledge uh, and awareness in the community, in all sorts of communities. So we've got a list here of the um, different things that we did. We ran a, a bunch of yarning circles with uh, uh, Naranjeri elders and younger people, a series of those around the lower lakes. Um, we've um, published newsletters. There's been lots of media stories in both newspapers and radio. Um, and most recently, actually, on the 7.30 report, someone might have, some of you might have seen that as well. Uh, we've run webinars, we've run workshops, uh, we've talked to schools and community groups, including NGOs um, and um, uh, lots and lots of individual land holders and their next door neighbours and so on. Um, oh, uh, what have I done? I don't seem to be... Oh, don't tell me I've frozen too. Oh, okay. We can still hear and see you with your slides. Oh, yes, you're okay. <laughs> uh, workshops. So we run lots of workshops and more workshops and more workshops and more workshops. Uh, and the, the message here is uh, we need to uh, be out there and, and physically interacting with people. People find it really um, rewarding to have um, experts come and talk to them. And so uh, from these images, you can see that we've talked to everybody from small children to um, old people, all, almost with Zimmer frames, um, and um, lots of different um, community clubs um, and Indigenous groups and so on. Um, lots, of, lots and lots of people. Um, we've run uh, or been, been present at events. So here's Sylvia at uh, River Murray Field Day. Um, so, uh, and this is just one example. There's been lots of events as well. And so to um, uh, the, all the questions that Sylvia raised, how did the grant enable us to um, achieve things that we wouldn't otherwise have achieved? We actually launched TurtleSat, the mobile phone app, um, in um, uh, about 2014. Um, and yesterday, I, I downloaded this um, screenshot on the right here, um, yesterday, and we got over 21,000 entries. And 70 to 80% of those entries have come in the three years since we launched 1 million turtles. Um, so the awareness raising that we have done has um, uh, really paid dividends. Uh, and of course, TurtleSat has a national coverage. Um, well, uh, um, the grant with this um, um, facilitation of the team with their skills in um, in all sorts of things, um, uh, uh, communication things, um, it enabled us to recruit many, many, many new people, that many more people than I ever imagined. Um, there are a lot of people who really want to do something. They love turtles. They don't know what to do. They want someone to help them. Um, and, um, and, you know, they've been engaged in the project all, all the way along. It's been fantastic. Um, we've um, um, upskilled these citizen scientists with scientific methods by um, having projects that they can do. And those projects, some of them require ethics training. So we spent a bit of time um, with university ethics committees uh, um, ensuring that they would accredit the citizen scientists um, with an online um, ethics um, um, course, really. It was a fairly short quiz, really, um, but and very straightforward. Um, but we thought this, th this was important. And of course, we had to do it for the university as well. Um, and as I mentioned before, we want to empower citizen scientists to, to uh, in a way that enabled them to continue 
the um, efforts, the conservation efforts into the future. Um, uh, so uh, what worked better than we'd imagined? Um, I, um, as I've already said, recruitment. We got many, many more people than I um, anticipated we would get. Um, and people were coming to us and, uh, you know, they were finding us online and through various other um, uh, avenues like the media um, and coming to us and wanting to be involved. Um, and the enthusiasm that they brought was just tremendous and um, enthusiasm from all of these different groups um, that I um, that we've got on the screen here. Um, and the one really, really satisfying thing to me is that the cause of the turtles is being taken up um, without our direct input into the organisations that are taking them up. So the South Australian Department of Environment and Water have recently been or well, the first um, jurisdiction in Australia to include turtles in their formal water management plans. We didn't push them to do that, but what we think we have done is um, raised awareness to the point that people are now um, picking up and understanding what the um, issues with, tur uh, with turtles are. Uh, and I'm going to just hand over to Sylvia, I think, now um, to say a few, a few things about some of these other lessons. <laughs> yes. So the, what other lessons did we learn? Well, that communication is really important. And because people, there's all just sort of different demographics and people have different time time commitments and get their information in different ways now that you really need to use multiple modes of communication um, so we, we had social media, which takes so much more time than you think it will to do it effectively. Uh, yeah, the newsletter, webs, the website and keeping the website up to date with a whole lot of information has been really critical to this. Keeping, it's been really hard to get the information at the right level, you know, not to give people too much information, but then also give them enough to feel confident to go and do things. Evaluation surveys, which has already come up again, has, has been a big one, like really useful to know if you're on the right track and what people are getting out of it, but really hard to get them to fill in. And we were lucky that Geeta Ortak, who worked on this project, while she's not a social scientist per se, she's got a lot of expertise in evaluation of citizen science projects. So she was a real help with that and getting the ethics approvals through as well. Hands-on instruction, well, you can put as much information out into the ether as you want. I think those those one-on-one -on -one connections is what has um, really helped people get the confidence to, to do some more. Mike, you're pressing my button. Oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, we did have a multi-skilled team. So... Uh, a lot of academics, but also uh, Geeta and I who are involved with engagement and citizen, running citizen science projects. But we also had other state representatives come on board who weren't officially part of the team to start with. We had Anthony from Western Australia and Marilyn from Queensland who kind of connected with the project and voluntarily joined the team and uh, put themselves up as state representatives for their states too, which was amazing. And I think the availability of that expertise in each state really helped as well. If there was someone that really needed that hands-on one-on-one support, there was someone in their state who was able to give it. We did have frequent team meetings because we were dispersed across the nation, uh, but they were good at keeping everyone on track and, and sharing what we were learning. We we were meant to start the project with a workshop to get key community champions together, but because of COVID, we weren't able to do that and we ran webinars instead. But we were just able, just two weeks ago, able to have a final showcase workshop with everyone together. And it was just, it was an amazing experience to see how much optimism and knowledge and passion there was for turtles across Australia. So partnerships have been really important. And one of the things that I really love about this project is how inclusive it was. You know, we weren't trying to be the only people that do turtle citizen science. If anyone else in conservation, if anyone out in Australia was interested in turtles, they were part of the team. You're automatically part of the team. There was, um, which I think has then made it able to expand its, its outcomes even further. And yeah, word got out and people came to us, which was amazing. 
the two-way interaction was really important. So the scientists trained the citizens, but then the citizens then obviously went out and collected the data, but then they provided local knowledge back to and for the traditional owners, cultural knowledge. And then they went on and it was sort of like train the trainer. They went on and then trained other people as well. And some uh, created community groups where they all get together and when it's turtle nesting time, they all go out and protect the nest together. Communication, communication, communication. So <laughs> between the team members, but also between us and and the people of Australia has just been critical to the to this project. Um, am I back to you? Or you? Back to <laughs> okay. you. I well, don't write papers. Yes, of course we've got plans for um, peer reviewed publications. There are four academics involved in this, and some of them are fairly junior academics who need that for their career development, apart from anything else. Um, and um, our, our publications are at two levels. One is the biology of the turtles, so the data that have been collected and how they're analysed and what it means to the turtles and their conservation. But also uh, the social science side of things that, um, you know, has already been mentioned a couple of times, uh, evaluations of the citizen science uh, per se. And we actually have a little track record in this. Um, we had a PhD student a little while ago who worked with a social scientist to analyse turtle sap data. That was prior to the launch of the One Million Turtles project. Um, but, uh, and those papers have been really highly cited, and again, more cited than some of the, um, uh, the uh, biology papers. And hot off the press, there's One Million Turtles Empowering Communities to Save Australian Freshwater Turtles was accepted for publication today, final acceptance. So, um, there, and that's, uh, uh, the, so it's sort of a social science perspective as well as a biology perspective. Um, we um, have run all sorts of evaluations. Well, when I say we, I mean Sylvia and Gita have run all sorts of evaluations. But I just threw up some words here from the evaluations at the end of the showcase workshop. Um, and um, um, as Sylvia mentioned, they were, the, the whole workshop was very, very positive. Um, and... Um, and it was very useful to have people from all different parts of the country come together because the situations are different in different parts of the country and the uh, the solutions that they came to to uh, address some of the issues, they learned from each other. It was really, really uh, rewarding. Um, okay, where are we going now? I think we've got the same sort of issues. We've all got the same sort of issues. Uh, we, the, the program will continue because all of these turtle biologists will be continuing to, uh, to study turtles. Uh, one of the gratifying things for me is this is the first opportunity as a, an academic who's sat in an ivory tower all my life um, to actually um, have on-ground um, uh, outcomes and working with um, councils and government and citizens has been great. Um, as uh, as everyone else, the funding is uncertain, and we're applying for grants. We haven't, Erin, uh, we haven't uh, been rejected for any yet, but that's only because we only just started applying for them. <laughs> um, and um, um, and we're you know confident that the citizens are now trained and empowered to continue the the work in their own local areas, and they've got the enthusiasm to do that. Um, and at the moment, we're having a series of meetings to discuss. Uh, not only the future grants, but also how we're going to manage it, what the governance and all, all that is. Should should we do this through a university? Should we set up an NGO? Should, or is there some other sort of model? Um, and it might be um, helpful for us to discuss that a bit later. Um, and, um, and of course, oh, we've already mentioned the, the big final workshop slash showcase that we had. Um, and... Um, I think one of the lessons here is that we started small um, and it has grown. And what we want to do is is not lose what we've developed in the meantime and um, sustain it into the future. And that's it for us for the time being. Thank you. Thanks, Mike and your sidekick. Um, <laughs> uh, one other thing I want to say about that final sh showcase workshop that we had is that in the evaluations, just about everybody said, we want to do this again. We want to get together again. So finding a way to connect people like that, they, that social connection was really important for them as well as doing the thing, their own thing in their own place. 
and uh, and even if it's just state based ones, they thought that would be useful as well. So we'll try and make that happen somehow. All right. Do we have any questions? Katie. Um, yeah, so you mentioned, Mike, just then about governance. Is there yes. something that you're leaning towards, and especially in terms of being able to run future mini conferences and that kind of thing, have you had a, a think about what would be the easiest way or the most effective way to keep that going? Uh, we don't know. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's um, tricky. So um, we've, we've looked at some models within universities for organisation you know, and, and environment institutes and things like that. Um, but we haven't really decided, um, you know, what, what's the best way to go. And um, they, you know, different, those different models require different sort of governance structures and so on. Um, and, uh, um, and, you know, we, we haven't had the really hard discussion yet about whether, um, uh, uh, what the implications for one sort of model over another one are. Um, one thing that has happened, though, is uh, Million Turtles won a, a Eureka Prize last year, um, and that's really raised the profile of the, pro, uh, the whole program within two of the universities. Um, so, you know, the deans and the DVC for research are really on board now and sort of encouraging us to go that way. So if the universities are going to actually provide a bit of support, We'll go that way, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. And I, I guess in terms of, sorry, um, South Australian support, because my role is permanent within the Murraylands and Riverland Landscape Board as a citizen science project officer and turtles are, it's been such a fantastic project and turtles are in, in decline in our region that we'll definitely be keeping this as a focus project for our region into the future. Do you have any other questions? We have gone slightly over time. In in terms of governance, um, Aaron, your have you kind of stayed connected with your team, or I guess you don't need all of them anymore. But <laughs> um, we had Go on. we what we had like a final wrap up meeting last year. That was last year, wasn't it? Yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I haven't really reconnected with the whole team since then. Um, if it, that's the, we've got some funding just now from the Environment Institute at the uni to hold this stakeholder workshop. So um, yeah. I'll be getting back in touch with everyone in the next month or two and, and planning for that. Right. Uh, can I, Sylvia? Yes. Uh, <laughs> uh, yes. <laughs> I, I was just writing down a few things that I think are um, uh, common to all three projects, um, and I th um, one of them uh, is the the um, two way interaction between the scientists and the citizen scientists. So it's not just uh, the scientists using citizens to collect data for them. Um, you know, this two way thing. Um, one is the importance of communication um, and um, uh, the, I think, I don't know about the, um, the all, all the projects on Kangaroo Island, but certainly, you know, Erin mentioned that she um, had ran a pilot and essentially that's what the Million Turtles did as well. So you needed to have a, sort of some track record before applying for the grant was the sort of message I got from there. Um, and in the challenges, one of the things that just keeps coming up and it came up at our workshop a lot in Albury a couple of weeks ago was red tape. Yeah, the, I think Aaron said eight months for the for the um, um, education things. Um, and um, what was yours, Kirsten? It was, it was a long time as well. Anyway. Lots of things, <laughs> isn't it? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, and and we've Permit. we've run into the same thing. So that's why we were a little bit proud of the the way that we managed the um, ethics to uh, have um, citizens protecting nests and things like that. So that oh, and the other one uh, from um, Kirsten was um, 
uh, PhD students growing up and moving on. And yeah, uh, yeah we're, we've lost a couple of those and uh, I'd love them back, but they've got to move on. <laughs> Yeah, no, Mike, I thought the way that you um, developed your ethics was very elegant. The idea of having sort of a sub thing that uh, the citizen scientists did uh, be a very, very clever approach to what is obviously a very complicated issue. And it was complicated to get it through the ethics committee too. <laughs> but that's one, yeah, of but we did, yep. well, it's one of the good things about being involved with four universities, you can shop round. <laughs> uh, Rosalie, you got a question? Yeah, I was just thinking back with Erin with the school students. You were saying about them um, not uh, knowing whether they got the data back. And it just reminded me when I was back in primary school, like, you know, back a long time ago. Yesterday. We, um, <laughs> we sponsored uh, the a um, Southern Nose Wombat. And we never heard back what happened over the years. Last year, I'm at the field next meeting and I heard what had happened with the project and where it had gone on. So it was really exciting to hear that. With that was a long time. <laughs> yeah, it's quite a long time. <laughs> with school children, is there a way of um, building into a project a method whereby they can find out the information? Has that sort of I guess like they, they, you don't yeah. them. they have that ability because you've got the whole ethics and everything else, but they or their parents can um, have some way of finding. Yeah, I mean, everything is available on our website and each school has their own results page. So as long as the students know to look there, they can find it themselves. Um, yeah. But it's, yeah, that first step of them knowing where to find it. Right. Yeah, that's one of the good things about, oh, oh, yep. sorry, I was going to say, that's go, one Mark. of the good things about um, the TurtleSat app. The data are available to everybody, um, anybody, and you don't need a, 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 to register or log in or anything like that. You can um, see the data, except for a few uh, data points that, are either culturally sensitive or um, we want to protect the populations from uh, poaching. Yeah, and that, that is a concern for some of the community people as well. If they think that there is a poaching risk for their local population, they're sometimes a bit more reluctant to share their data. And that's another thing this project's done is also now connected with ALA which is so obviously, well, they, so they get data through iNaturalist. And so pretty much all the turtle data that's publicly available for Australia is now also incorporated into TurtleSat. All right, Rosalind, did you have another question? No, hand down. <laughs> uh, well, thank you very much to the speakers. That I found that really insightful to to hear what you how you all went and and what the learnings were and i hope that our audience appreciated it too and that more people will watch this through the recording so i hope you all have a wonderful citizen science month <laughs> and off off the year round <laughs> thanks for joining us ron <laughs> thank you sylvia